Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I shall be your host today. One of the most important poems of the Middle Ages and the greatest literary work in the Italian language was completed in 1321 shortly before the author's death. Florentine Durante di Alchiero degli Alchieri was an Italian poet, writer, and philosopher. He was also a statesman and a political theorist, as one does. The first words of this epic narrative poem were set on the page in 1308, and I quote, In the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood where the direct way was lost. It is a hard thing to speak of how wild, harsh, and impenetrable that wood was so that thinking of it recreates the fear. It is scarcely less bitter than death. But in order to tell of the good that I found there, I must tell of the other things I saw there. As you may well have guessed by now, the poem, composed of 14,233 lines, was titled The Divine Comedy, and the poet was, and long continues to be, to the world, simply known as Dante. According to the Italian Dante Society, no original manuscript by Dante has survived although there are many manuscript copies. The Divine Comedy can be described simply as an allegory, with each canto and the episodes therein containing many alternate meanings. Complex in every way, historical, moral, literal, mystical, spiritual, the poem is often lauded for its particularly human qualities, his skillful delineation of the characters he encounters in hell, purgatory, and paradise, and his bitter denunciations of Florentine and Italian politics, plus his powerful poetic imagination. Dante called the poem comedy. The adjective divine was added later in the 16th century because poems in the ancient world were classified as high for tragedy or low for comedy. Low poems had happy endings and were written in everyday language whereas high poems treated more serious matters and were written in an elevated style. Dante was one of the first in the Middle Ages to write of a serious subject, the redemption of humanity, in the low and, quote, vulgar Italian language, and not the Latin one might expect for such a serious topic. In Canto Two of the comedy, there are seven cantos in the Inferno. In Canto Number Two, a character by the name of Beatrice is the object of Dante's love and the one who, from heaven, graciously arranges for Virgil to escort Dante through hell. Long before Dante wrote the Inferno, he saw a woman by the name of Beatrice from afar 
and awed by her beauty and virtue, described the sight of her as a spark of, quote, new life, a renewal of his Christian faith. Yet that real Beatrice died young. And Dante wanders away from his religious commitments into the dark wilderness that symbolizes his waning faith. Now from heaven, Beatrice sees that Dante is lost and sends Virgil to, quote, set him free by means of the trip through hell. She then aids Dante throughout his journey. The thought of her gives Dante courage when he is stopped at the city of Diz. When Dante finally reaches the entryway to heaven, Beatrice personally appears to guide him. Because the Inferno places Beatrice in heaven near God, her aid of Dante represents the grace by which human beings grow spiritually. Beatrice is described as very lovely, with, quote, eyes flashing brighter than the stars, and an, quote, angel's voice. Her beauty represents the beauty of heaven and inspires Dante to pass forward in his spiritual journey. Ultimately, Beatrice is a compelling symbol of the wonder and power of divine grace, leaving and leading Dante to a mere step away from contemplating God. So significant a character to Dante's journal is Beatrice, one wonders if perhaps there was a real Beatrice in Dante's life. And the answer is, Yes, there was. <laughs> Near unanimous agreement now exists that a woman by the name of Beatrice Portinari, the daughter of a banker and one of the priors of Florence, lived in 1282. She was also married to another banker, Simone de Bardi, one of the most influential men in the city. But... Beatrice was Dante's true love. In his first sonnet in Vita Nova, published in 1294, Dante reveals that he saw Beatrice for the first time when his father took him to the Portinari house for a May Day party. They were children. He was nine years old and she was eight. Dante was instantly smitten and never got her forgot her after this meeting even though he married another woman Gemma Nodati in 1285 with whom he had three sons and one daughter according to tradition Dante and Beatrice were also neighbors outside the walls of Florence near the hill of Fiesole where the Portinari and Algeheri families had two neighboring summer villas. It is plausible that Dante and Beatrice met each other as children there. He would meet her again about nine years later in an unexpected fashion. Beatrice was walking along, dressed in white and accompanied by two older women, on Lungarno, one of the Florence streets along the Arno River. She turned and greeted him. Dante remembered the episode well, but ran away without saying a word. Her salutation filled him with such joy that he retreated to his room to think about it. In so doing, he fell asleep and had a dream that would become the subject of that first sonnet in La Vida Nuova. La Vida Nuova contains 42 brief chapters with commentaries on 25 sonnets. One chapter is left unfinished, interrupted by the death of Beatrice Portinari. 
Dante's lifelong lover. Today's book and author in the spotlight returns Dante and Beatrice to our consciousness in the sparse and powerful prose of one of the most influential and provocative authors of our times. With characteristic insight and what the Washington Post recently called, quote, a brittle wit that forces our attention on the common terrors we don't want to think about. The book appeared on bookshelves a short two months ago in September. In the book, the Pole, P-O-L-E, the new novel by the South African writer J.M. Kutsi, Beatrice is transformed into a 40-something socialite in Barcelona, <laughs> the wife of a wealthy Spanish banker, Beatrice volunteers with the Concert Circle, a cultural foundation that hosts monthly recitals in Barcelona's Gothic Quarter. She has been let in because of her ample free time and her impressive Rolodex, not her ear. As the book opens, the rather staid board of directors has flown a Polish pianist in his 70s from Berlin to perform works by Friedrich Chopin, another Polish musician adrift outside his homeland. The man's name, Witold Valsakiewicz, has so many W's and C's in it, the narrator explains, that no one on the board even tries to pronounce it. They've referred to him simply as the pole. Reminiscent of James Joyce's The Dead, in its exploration of love and loss, the pole with lean verse and surprising fates is a haunting work, evoking the inexhaustible palette of sensations from blind love to compassion. But before exploring more of the story told, let us consider some facts about the author. J.M. Kutzi, C-O-E-T-Z-E-E, -E, Kutzi. The prolific award-winning J.M. Kutzi, born in 1940, is a South African and Australian novelist, essayist, linguist, translator, and recipient of the 2003 Nobel Prize in Literature. He's one of the most critically acclaimed and decorated authors in the English language, having also won the Booker Prize, not once, but twice, the Khan Literary Award, thrice, the Jerusalem Prize, the Prix Fremena Etranger Award, and the Irish Times International Fiction Prize. Enjoying his formative years in Cape Town, Cape Province, Union of South Africa, Kutsi studied mathematics and English at the University of Cape Town and received his Bachelor of Arts with honors in English in 1950 and his Bachelor of Arts with honors in mathematics in 1961. Kutsi then moved to London in 1962, remaining there until 65, three years. At the same time, working on his degree for a Master of Arts in Literature, which he received in 1963 from the University of Cape Town. Then, believe it or not, on to the University of Texas at Austin on the Fulbright program, receiving his doctorate in 1969. Kuzi taught literature at the State University of New York at Buffalo through 1971, and it was during these years that he began his first novel, 
always a momentous occasion. It was called Dusk Lands. Kutsi was the first writer to be awarded the Booker Prize twice for Life and Times of Michael K. in, 18, in 1983 and for Disgrace in 1999. Only four other authors have received such a reward. Summertime, named on the 2009 long list, was an early favorite to win Pootsie, an unprecedented third booker, but it made the short list and lost to Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Pootsie was also long listed in 2003 for Elizabeth Costello, and in 2005, for Slow Man. <laughs> Incredible. The School Days of Jesus, a follow up to his 2013 novel, The, Ch the Childhood of Jesus, was long listed for the 2016 Booker Prize. Everyone at the Booker Prize must know him by face and by name. <laughs> On 2 October 2003, Kuzu was chosen as that year's recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature making him the fourth African writer to be so honored and the second South African writer. When awarding the prize, the Swedish Academy stated that Kutsi, in innumerable guises, portrays the surprising involvement of the outsider. The Pole is Kutsi's 20th novel including three autobiographical in nature. He has also authored three books of short fiction. In 2006, Kutsi became an Australian citizen. It had been argued this acquired Australianness be deliberately adopted and stressed by Australians. Now the book, The Pole. The Pole tells the story of Vittor Valsakivas, a vigorous, extravagantly white-haired pianist and interpreter of Chopin, who becomes infatuated with Beatrice, a stylish patron of the arts, after she helps organize his concert in Barcelona. Although Beatrice, a married woman, is initially unimpressed by Witold and his gleaming dentures. She soon finds herself pursued and ineptly swept into his world. As the journeyman performer sends her countless letters, extends invitations to travel, and even visits her husband's summer home in Majorca, their unlikely relationship blossoms, though only on Beatrice's terms. The power struggle between them intensifies, eventually escalating into a full-fledged battle of the sexes. But is it Beatrice who limits their passion by paralyzing her emotions? Or is it Witold, the old man at his typewriter and keyboard, trying to force into life his dream of love, as did Dante? Well, in my humble opinion, the pole is truly my kind of book. Exactly. Tight, succinct nearly minimist, and yet rich and intelligent in storyline. The year is 2015, although only the happenings in the lives and oftentimes only in the minds of Beatrice and Whittle gain complete focus. The book of only 166 pages is divided into six parts, each part with as many as 45 chapters of two sentences to 10 paragraphs. The final chapter, as a matter of fact, is composed of only a single sentence. 
as reinventing the all-encompassing life of poet Dante for his Beatrice, Cusi exposes the fundamentally enigmatic nature of romance, showing how a chance meeting between strangers, even a Pole, a man of 70, a vigorous 70, and a stultified banker's wife who occupies her days in good works can suddenly change everything. It is a rare book where every word counts. It's a book that captures and briefly thinks through each step, step of a, a new relationship. Decisions are made. Decisions are changed. Decisions are made again. Only wistfully made invitations to more are introduced, denied, rethought, accepted. A super fan of J.M. Kutzi since the arrival of his most successful book, Disgrace, in 1999. I eagerly await each new book every two to three years. The Pole is the newest book of J.M. Putsi on the shelf, number 20, and I am now 20 times more the fan since the publishing of his first book, Dustlands, back in 1974. I highly recommend The Pole to readers who enjoy abandoning words like epic, allegory, complex, preferring words like precise, personal, and provocative. J.M. Kutsi, The Pole. I am going to begin reading today at the beginning, so I sometimes skip the beginning and go to juicier parts. And then I am going to skip ahead to juicier parts. Uh, the very first uh, chapter of part one, uh, the chapters do have no names, but they do have a number. So chapter one, numeral one. The sentence, it is only one, is this. The woman is the first to give him trouble, followed afterwards by the man. Number two, at the beginning, he has a perfectly clear idea of who the woman is. She is tall and graceful. By conventional standards, she may not qualify as a beauty, but her features, dark hair and eyes, high cheekbones, full mouth, are striking. And her voice, a low contralto, has a suave, attractive power. Sexy? No, she's not sexy and certainly not seductive. She might have been sexy when she was young. How could she not have been with a figure like that? But now in her 40s, she goes in for a certain remoteness. She walks, one notices this particularly, without swinging her hips, gliding across the floor erect even stately. That is how he would sum up her exterior. As for herself, her soul, there is time for that to reveal itself. Of one thing he is convinced, she's a good person, kind, friendly. Number three, the man is more troublesome in concept, again, he is perfectly clear. He is a Pole, a man of 70, a vigorous 70, a concert pianist best known as an interpreter of Chopin, but a controversial interpreter. His Chopin is not at all romantic, but on the contrary, somewhat austere. Chopin as inheritor of Bach. To that extent, he is an oddity on the concert scene, odd enough to draw a small but discerning audience in Barcelona, 
the city to which he has been invited, the city where he will meet the graceful, soft-spoken woman. But barely has the pole emerged into the light and he begins to change. With his striking mane of silver hair, his idiosyncratic renderings of Chopin, the pole promises to be a distinct enough personage. But in matters of soul, of feeling, he is troublingly opaque. At the piano, he plays with soul undeniably. But the soul that rules him is Chopin's, not his own. And if that soul strikes one as unusually dry and severe, it may point to a certain aridity in his own temperament. Four. Where do they come from? The tall Polish pianist and the elegant woman with the gliding walk, the banker's wife who occupies her days in good works. All year they have been knocking at the door wanting to be let in or else dismissed and laid to rest. Now, at last, has their time come? Number five. The invitation to the pole comes from the circle that stages monthly recitals in the Sala, Sala Monpu in Barcelona's Gothic Quarter and has been doing so for decades. The recitals are open to the public, but tickets are expensive and the audience tends to be wealthy, aging, and conservative in its tastes. The woman in question, her name is Beatrice, is a member of the board that administers the series. She performs this role as a civic duty, but also because she believes that music is good in itself as love is good, or charity, or beauty, and good, furthermore, in that it makes people better people. Though well aware that her beliefs are naive, she holds to them anyway. She is an intelligent person, but not reflective. A portion of her intelligence consists in an awareness that excess of reflection can paralyze the will. Number six, the decision to invite the Pole, whose name has too many W's and C's in it, that no one on the board even tries to pronounce it, they refer to him simply as the Pole, is arrived at only after some soul searching. His candidacy was proposed not by her, Beatrice, but by her friend Margarita, the animating spirit behind the concert series, who in her youth studied at the conservatory in Madrid and knows much more about music than she does. The Pole, says Margarita, led the way for a new generation of Chopin interpreters in his native land. She circulates a review of a concert he gave in London. According to the reviewer, the fashion for a hard, percussive Chopin, Chopin as Prokofiev, has had its day. It was never anything but a modernist reaction against the branding of the Franco-Polish master as a delicate, dreamy, feminine spirit. The emerging historically authentic Chopin is soft-toned and Italianette. The Pole's revisionary reading of Chopin, even if somewhat over-intellectualized, is to be loud. She, Beatrice, is not sure that she wants to hear an evening's worth of historically authentic Chopin, nor, more pertinently, whether the rather staid circle will take kindly to it. But Margarita feels strongly about the matter, and Margarita is her friend, so she gives her her support. The invitation to the poll accordingly went out with a proposed date and a proposed fee and was accepted. Now the day has arrived. He has flown in from Berlin, has been met at the airport and driven to his hotel. The plan for the evening is that, after the recital, she, together with Margarita and Margarita's husband, will take him out to dinner. Seven. 
Why will Beatrice's own husband not be one of the party? The answer, because he never attends concert circle events. Number eight. The plan is simple enough, but then there is a hitch. On the morning in question, Margarita telephones to say that she has fallen ill. That is the rather formal term she uses. Cuido enferma, fallen ill. What has she fallen ill with? She does not say. She's vague, deliberately so, it would seem. But she will not be coming to the recital, nor will her husband. Therefore, will she, Beatrice, please take over the duties of hospitality, that is to say, arrange to have their guests conveyed from hotel to auditorium in good time, and entertain him afterwards. If he wants to be entertained uh, so that when he returns to his native country, he will be able to say to his friends, yes, I had a good time in Barcelona on the whole. Yes, they took good care of me. Very well, says Beatrice, I will do it, and I hope you get better soon. Number nine. She has known Margarita since they were children together at the nuns' school. She's always admired her friend's spirit, her enterprise, her social aplomb. Now she must take her place. What will it entail? Entertaining a man on a fleeting visit to a strange city? Surely at his age he will not expect sex. But he will certainly expect to be flattered, even flirted with. Flirting is not an art she has ever cared to master. Margarita is different. Margarita has a light touch with men. She, Beatrice, has more than once with amusement watched her friend go about her conquests. But she has no wish to imitate her. If their guest has high expectations in the Department of Flattery, he's going to be disappointed. And number 10. The pole is, according to Margarita, a truly memorable pianist. She heard him in the flesh, in Paris. Is it possible that something happened between the two of them? Margarita and the Pole in the flesh, and that having engineered his visit to Barcelona. Margarita is at the last minute having cold feet, or has her husband finally had enough and issued a fiat? Is that how falling ill is to be understood? Why must everything be so complicated? And now she must take care of the stranger. There is no reason to expect he speaks Spanish. What if he starts to not speak English either? What if he is the kind of Pole who speaks French? The only regulars in the concert circle who speak French are the Lezinski. Esther and Tomas, and Tomas in his 80s is becoming infirm. How will the Pole feel when, instead of the vivacious Margarita, he is offered the discrepant Lezinskis? She is not looking forward to the evening. What a life, she thinks, the life of an itinerant entertainer. The airports, the hotels, all different, yet all the same. The hosts to put up with all different yet all the same, gushing middle-aged women with bored attendant husbands, enough to quench whatever spark there is in the soul. At least she does not gush, nor does she chatter. If after his performance the pole wants to retreat into moody silence, she will be moody right back. Eleven. Producing a concert, making sure that everything runs smoothly, is no small feat. The burden has now fallen squarely on her. She spends the afternoon at the concert hall, chivying the staff. Their supervisor is, in her experience, dilatory. Ticking off details. It is necessary to list the details? No. But it is by her attention to detail that Beatrice will prove that she possesses the virtues of diligence and competence. By comparison, 
the pole will show himself to be impractical, unenterprising. If one can conceive of virtue as a quantity, then the greater part of the pole's virtue is spent on his music, leaving hardly any behind for his dealings with the world. Whereas Beatrice's virtue is expended evenly in all directions. We shall stop part one there. The dinner does happen. The flattery does need to be. The flirting is very vague and very simple and hardly noticeable. But on the way out and home, there are, um, there are rumblings, let's say that. And um, she continues to need to entertain him as long as he's in Barcelona. Um, so um, she's caught on the spot. Uh, we're going to skip ahead, though, to things that get a little more uh, tense and a little more mentally or intellectually challenging. <clears throat> And so we skip ahead to the third section. Beginning with chapter 39 in this middle section. She's caught up in the complicity of the situation. Why is she castigating herself, making herself look foolish and complacent and even philistine? What has got into her? She does not dream. She never dreams. She sleeps long and deeply and dreamlessly and wakes in the morning, refreshed, renewed. With her restful sleep and healthy way of life, she will probably live to be a hundred. Instead of dreaming, she indulges her imagination. She can imagine all too well what a week in Brazil with Whittle in the company of that pole would be like. In particular, she can imagine what it would be like if they slept together. She would have to pretend to be in ecstasies and he would have to pretend to believe her. I absolve you. That is what she needs to say to him before they set foot on Brazilian soil. I absolve you from all erotic duties. You sleep in your bed and I will sleep in mine. She wonders if he keeps a diary, diary of a seducer. Would, it, would he dare to put her in his diary? The week he spent in Brazil with a certain lady from Barcelona, quote, who out of respect for her family shall remain nameless. She does do some conniving and planning in order to carry off that whole week at Barcelona that he continues to stay on, even though he was supposed to be there only for the concert and the following day. We go right to the next part and see how complicated things might get. <laughs> an email arrives with an audio file attached. Chopin's B minor sonata. Quote, I record this for you alone. In English, I cannot say what is in my heart. Therefore, I say it in music. Please listen. I pray to you. A bit of passion developing, shall we say. She obeys. She listens, paying hawk-like attention to the phrasing, the inflections, the minutest accelerations and decelerations, anything that could be strewed as a private message. She comes up blank, baffled. It sounds just like his Deutsche gramophone recording in the concert circle library. If he has smuggled in a message, it is in a code he does not know how to read. But two. Time passes. Another email. I will be in Mallorca in October for the Chopin Festival. After Mallorca, perhaps your concert circle will invite me again. That is my warm hope. She writes back. Dear Whithold, thank you for the recording and how good to hear you will be playing at the Chopin Festival. Alas, the program of our concert circle is settled for the rest of the year. Yours, Beatrice. A day later, she writes again. Dear Whithold, it so happens that my husband's family owns a house near the town of Soler, not far from Val de Mosso, where the Chopin Festival will be held. My husband and I will be spending some time there in October. Would you like to join us after your commitments? 
The house is spacious. You will have your own quarters. Let me know what you'll think. Yours, Beatrice. He writes back. Thank you, thank you, but I cannot be a friend of the family. We're told. He adds a P.S. A friend of the family is a famous Polish novel. People call it the Polish Werther. She has heard of Werther, but not of a friend of the family. Is there another coded message there? Does he expect her to track down a friend of the family and read it? <laughs> Absurd man. Number three. She speaks to her husband. Are we still going to Solaire in October? I guess, if you like. If the house is free. The house will be free. I thought of asking Tomas and Eva and the child. Good, good. Will you make the arrangements? But for no longer than a week. I will make the arrangements, but I will probably stay on after you leave. A week is too short. She is not often duplicitous. She prefers frankness. She prefers laying the cards on the table. But sometimes laying one's cards on the table is not a good idea. Chapter four. She speaks to Tomas, her son. Oh, not possible, he says. I can't take time off from work. And anyway, it's no fun traveling with a baby. And five. She books flights and calls the housekeeper in Solaire to instruct her to open up the house. She enjoys making plans, settling details. If the concert circle runs smoothly, it's due to her diligence and her care for detail. Six. She has no intention of going to Valdemosa to hear the pole play. Let him come to her. Plotting. Plotting. Number seven. The house outside Solaire was bought during the 1940s by her husband's grandfather, who had made his fortune in shipping. At the time when he bought it, it was still the hub of a working farm. But over the years, he sold off the farmland parcel by parcel until it was left with only the big house and its outbuildings. It was there that her husband spent his holidays as a child, and he still has a deep attachment to the place. He is deeply attached, yet he visits less and less. She cannot understand why. She herself has come to love the old house, with its austere stonework and its high ceilings, and its dim passages, and the cool courtyard, with its riot of plumbago and bougainvillea, and the great old fig tree at the center. Number eight. There is the question of conscience. Is her conscience going to plague her over her invitation to the pole? Her conscience did not plague her over the young man at the gymnasium, who she allowed to flirt with her last year, and who once cornered her and tried to kiss her. She yielded her neck, her throat, but not her lips. Is it a question of territory? Is the gymnasium neutral ground, whereas the house in Solaire is her husband's territory, and the territory of his family going back two generations? The pole is in his 70s, in the evening of his years. The man at the gymnasium was in his 20s, with a vigorous male life stretching before him. The cases are hardly comparable. It would be forgivable if her husband were jealous of the man at the gymnasium, and not if he were jealous of the pole. A man of the pole's age should not give rise to jealousy. He does not have that power. In any event, she has no intention of sleeping with him. When he comes to Solaire, he can share her domestic routines. He can accompany her to the supermarket and help carry the groceries. He can dredge leaves out of the swimming pool. There's a piano in one of the spare rooms, an old upright. He can fix it up and play for her. By the end of the week, his romantic fantasies will have gone up in smoke. He will have seen her as she truly is. He can then return to his native land, a sadder and wiser man. 
Number nine. Do you remember the Polish pianist who asked me to fly with him to Brazil? She says to her husband. He's going to be in Mallorca at the same time we are. He will be performing at the Chopin Festival. Do you mind if I invite him to lunch? Of course not. But wouldn't you rather see him by yourself? No, I think you should see me en famille. That should bring him down to earth. He has rather elevated notions about me. Plotting. Her invitation to the poll is couched in unusually specific terms. If he wishes to see her, he should plan to arrive on such and such a date and depart on such and such a date. He should catch the number 203 bus from the Val de Mosa to the bus station in Solaire. If he calls in advance and informs her of his time of arrival, she will pick him up. He will be housed not in the main residence, but in a cottage of the grounds. The cottage has a fully equipped kitchen in case he wishes to cook for himself. Otherwise, he is welcome to share meals with her, Beatrice, his hostess, meals which we prepared by the housekeeper. His time will be his own. It reads, and is meant to read, like an invitation to a paying guest. Number 11. When the time comes, she and her husband travel to Soledad and enjoy a quiet week together. The weather is a little cool, a little windy, but nothing to complain about. The roads are empty. Most of the tourists are gone. They drive to Bani al to Pergara, where she has a long, invigorating swim. They dine at a restaurant in Fornalutz that they have always been fond of. Number 12. What has happened about the Polish musician? asked her husband. I thought he was coming to lunch. Uh, the dates didn't work out, she replies. He isn't free until next week, and you'll be gone by then. Oh, what a pity, says her husband. I would have liked to meet him. He smiles. She smiles. They have navigated tricky passages before. They will navigate this one. Her husband leaves. The pole arrives. She picks him up at the bus station in the little Suzuki that they keep in Soler. Nearly a year has passed since Girona. He had noticeably aged. He is, in fact, an old man. Of course, it is natural that he should have aged. Why should he be proof against the ravages of time? Nevertheless, she is disappointed. More than disappointed. Dismayed. She wonders what the audiences in Valdemosa thought of him. A spectre from the past? Is that what they thought? But perhaps for some, he assumes an aura of timeless authority when he sits down at the keyboard. Chapter 14. He kisses her on both cheeks. So fresh you look, so beautiful, he murmurs. His lips are dry, his skin soft, babyish, the skin of an old man. Chapter 15. They drive to the house in silence. The road up the hill is pitted, but she is a good driver, better than most of the men she knows. When they are on the island, her husband leaves the driving to her. I know I am in safe hands, he says. Number 16. She shows the pole to his cottage. I will leave you to unpack and settle in. When lunch is ready, Loretto, the maid, will ring the bell. You are gracious, says the pole. Gracious. What an old-fashioned bookish word. Does it have a meaning any longer? Ave Maria, gratia plena, ora pro nobis. 17. He responds promptly to the lunchtime bell. He's changed his clothes. He now wears sandals, cream-colored slacks, a sky-blue shirt. He bears a Panama hat, ready for what the afternoon will bring. She introduced him to Loreto. No habla espanol, she tells Loreto. 
He doesn't speak Spanish. Loreto, Loredo gives him a tight smile, a nod. Senor. She introduces him. Uh, Loreto looks after this house and another further down the valley, belonging to a Mexican. She arrives and leaves on a 125cc moped. Her husband's an odd job guy and gardener. They have a son and a daughter, both grown up, both married, both living on the mainland. Nothing about Laredo is surprising. That is to say, of what she knows about Laredo, nothing surprises her, not even the moped. But of course, Laredo has a life of her own, invisible to her employers, which may well be full of surprises. It may contain, for instance, Laredo's equivalent of the pole, a man who finds her, Laredo, to be full of grace and worth pursuing. It's only a matter of chance that the story being told is not about Laredo and her man, but about her, Beatrice, and her Polish admirer. Another fall of the dice and the story would be about Laredo's submerged life. We shall go with one more chapter here. I hope you are hungry. The writer has made us old style tumbet. Do you know it? Did they serve it in Valdemosa? In Catalonia, we have a similar dish, but we call it some faina. She has always been a good hostess, skilled at putting guests at their ease. It is particularly important to put the Paul at his ease to make him feel at home so that when he leaves, it will be without pleasant memories, with pleasant memories. Your husband did not come, asked the Pole. Uh, my husband came, but then was called back to his office. He sends his regrets. He is sorry he could not meet you. He's a good man, your husband. What a strange question. Yes, I believe he's a good man. It's not hard to be good in our times. Yes, you think so? I do. We live in fortunate times. In fortunate times, it is not hard to be good. Do you think otherwise? I do not live in fortunate times, but I try to be good. She does not see how the person sitting on one side of the table can live in fortunate times, while the person on the other side of the table does not. But she lets it pass. But tell me about your daughter, the singer. She lives in Germany, I remember you saying. How is she getting on? I will show you. He takes out his phone and shows her a picture of a tall, serious-looking girl in her teens, dressed all in white. It's an old picture from the old days, but I keep it. Now it is different. She's married. She lives in Berlin. She and her husband have a restaurant, a grand success, which brings them much money. <laughs> the singing, that is in the past, I think. So successful, yes, but not happy, not blessed, not blessed. It is sometimes hard to know what the man means with his complete English. Is he saying something profound or is he simply hitting the wrong words? like a monkey sitting in front of a typewriter. Are people with much money truly not happy? She has much money and is happy, more or less. The Pole must have much money too after all his concerts and does not seem unhappy. Gloomy, perhaps, but not miserable. Perhaps he means that the daughter in Berlin is discontented. Discontent is not uncommon. Discontent, not knowing what one wants. Do you see her often? And do you and she get so long together? The Pole raises his hands, palms upward, in a gesture she cannot decode. Whether she comes from it means have courage, press on, but where he comes from it could mean something quite different. There is nothing to be done, for example. We are civilized, said the Pole, but she does not have any soul. She has her mother's soul. Civilized. 
Uh, how to translate? We do not fly each, each other's throat. We do not yawn in each other's face. We greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. Whatever the case, being civilized in each other's company does not seem much of an achievement for a father and a daughter. Fortunately, she says, my children and I share the same soul, the same dispositions. We have the same blood running in our veins. That is good, says the Pope. Yes, it is good. I invited my eldest son to join us here in Soler. He is a serious person. You would like him. Unfortunately, he could not come. He and his wife have a new baby, and his wife finds it a strain to travel. One can understand. So you are a grandmother now. Yes, I will be 50 on my next birthday. Were you aware of that? Gentlemen, did not ask a lady's age. He delivers this pronouncement with a straight face. Does he never smile? Does he have no sense of the ridiculous? It sometimes happens, she says, that what a gentleman does not ask of a lady turns out to be what the gentleman in question does not want to know about the lady. What the gentleman would find unpleasing to know because it would be upset, it would upset some of the ideas about the lady that the gentleman holds, some of his preconceptions. The prole breaks off a wedge of bread, dips it in the sauce, makes no reply. Loreto, in the far corner of the kitchen, pretends to be washing the pans, but her manner suggests that she is listening. Perhaps she knows more English than she lets on. Have you finished, she says. Have you had enough? Would you like coffee? Subtle, eh? The game. The game of tag. He seems to be, in my reading of the book, very uh, one, one direction, one road, one determination. I've simply fallen in love with her, he thinks, from the outset. She, on the other hand, is not deliberately playing hard to get, but she is hard to get, so to speak. Uh, as you might guess, uh, this little extra stay of a week, um, the husband has left and the, the pole has returned, uh, has stayed, I mean, and now has moved into a cottage on the property. So it's probably only a question of time, don't you think? And I'm so right. I'm not going to tell you any more because then that would uh, really be a spoiler alert. Um, so I'm going to uh, keep the rest to me. But you could tell certainly that the style is very minimalist and very uh, succinct, very direct. Uh, she, uh, Beatrice, is also that way. Uh, so um, it goes along in a very very intriguing pace and very readable, very enjoyably readable. So I suggested to you, if you like all those words I talked about earlier, so J.M. Kutzi, The Pole, a novel. The cover of the book is quite interesting. It is the keyboard of a piano, of course, as you might expect, black and white. And it's marked new from the library in, where are we? Yeah, the Camden Public Library. I take books through Minerva, so they're from all over the state. Anyway, thus today's book, new on the shelves. If you like J.M. Kutzi, I would strongly suggest you get the book. You really want to know what's going on in both minds and how their paths will cross next. And let me uh, take a few moments before we end to tell you a tad bit about next week's book. I'm uh, going to read a book by an author whom I met once in Santa Fe, New Mexico, actually there. Uh, to give a lecture and a book reading. Uh, he was the 2016 winner of the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. And he uh, has written several books then, uh, since then. And we're going to read his new book. This is the month for new books, if you've not gathered. So this is a new book on the shelf. It was published uh, just a couple of months ago, actually. He's now on tour uh, uh, promoting the book. Uh, the name of the book is called A Man of Two Faces. Man of Two Faces. 
understand. It is by the author Viet Tan Guvin. Viet Tan Guvin, N G U Y E N. Who win, not the, the W. Who win. Let me just read a couple of paragraphs to you just to try to catch your attention for next week's show. With insight, humor, formal invention, and lyricism, in a man of two faces, Viet Dong Guin rewinds the film of his own life. He expands the genre of personal memoir by acknowledging larger stories of refugeehood, colonization, and ideas about Vietnam and America. Writing with his trademark sardonic wit and incisive analysis, as well as a deep emotional openness about his life as a father and the son. And a, just a little bit of backstory. At the age of four, Gu Yin, who win, and his family are forced to flee his hometown of Ban Ni Thruk and come to the USA as refugees. After being removed from his brother and parents and home for the family on his own, Huwin is later allowed to resettle into his own family in suburban San Jose, California. But there is violence hidden behind the sunny facade of what he calls America. I hope you'll join me for his book. I've read two of his other books um, and uh, quite amazing, actually. So, um, you know, a bit jarring and uh, a bit foreign to the Native Americans, let's say. Um, so uh, it's quite it's quite a good uh, memoir. A Man of Two Faces explores the necessity of both forgetting and of memory, the promises America so readily makes and breaks and the exceptional life story of one of the most original and important writers working today. Please join me for that, another new book of the last two or three months and the talk of the town, the literary world anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you'll tick that little iconic button there, the thumbs up, just as a vote of confidence for us. You may wish to share it, uh, which that option is available there on your screen as well. Uh, or you write, may want to write a comment about the author, uh, about the book itself, if you've already read it, about a past book. You could also write about Barcelona <laughs> or Warsaw, which is where our, our protagonist lives. Also, give us the name of your favorite book. Be happy to consider we are looking now at December. Um, and uh, so if you can send us a comment with your book, we might be able to put it in the schedule. Uh, and finally, uh, we'd love to have you subscribe. That icon is there as well. Subscribe usually implies money, as in book or magazine subscribe. <laughs> uh, this does not. This is not that at all. It's simply to gain your email address so that we can keep you updated about what's going on. Uh, in the programs department at the Camden Public Library. Also, by subscribing, it, that does one even greater thing. <laughs> All the public libraries in the state of Maine compete, the small, the medium, and the large, uh, to have the highest number of subscribers to their program's YouTube channel. I don't know the total number of libraries, but we are at 1,342 uh, subscribers to our program, which has been going for three years. Um, and we are currently in the number one spot. As a matter of fact, not to tout our glories, but we've been there for a year. <laughs> Some of the larger libraries are trying to catch up, but we're holding out completely. So if you do subscribe, that would certainly help us a good deal. We'd love to at least get to the 1,500 uh, by the end of the year, if we can. Thank you again for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed the book and the story behind it, the Beatrice Dante, and the, also the Beatrice Will Good Told. It's a lovely book, really. I hope you have a good week ahead. We seem to be topsy-turvy again, uh, as we are on this show this season. 
always. Uh, I scraped the windshield yesterday morning at eight o'clock in the morning. So that was the first frost that usually tells me what's coming next. <laughs> and do be careful, do be healthy, particularly with all the um, possible things going around in the shoulder, shoulder season and all of the immunizations, if you go for immunizations. Um, but do be healthy during this period as we lead into winter. And not everyone has this choice, unfortunately, but if you have the choice, try as hard as you can to be as positive as possible. We have a whole lot of negative going on in the world at the moment. Try somehow to stay positive if you can and be happy. Thank you so much. Goodbye.